content of this program is intended for people who are blind and print impaired. Hello and welcome to our February 2023 edition of Heard Any Good Books Lately? A program from the North Carolina Reading Service. I'm George Douglas. This program is brought to you by the Friends of the State Library of North Carolina Accessible Books and Library Services, an organization of citizens, volunteers, and patrons, all interested in supporting the library and the services it provides. The Friends Group was founded in 1989 and now has more than 300 members across North Carolina. If you'd like to join the Friends Group yourself, we'll have information on how how to do that later in the program. This program is all about books available from the State Library of North Carolina, accessible books and library services. The library has more than 86,000 titles in its collection. Books and magazines are available in large print, braille, and talking books as well. The library also has more than 11,000 patrons across the state, and if you're not a patron but are interested in becoming one, I'll have more information at the end of this program. This month, we'll take a look at some of the most popular books checked out in the month of January at the State Library of North Carolina, Accessible Books and Library Services. We begin the program today with a book entitled Sister Friends Forever. It's a novel by Kimberla Lawson Roby. Here's the plot. This emotional novel from a New York Times bestselling author follows four lifelong friends as each faces a crisis in family, love, and forgiveness. Serena, Michelle, Kenya, and Lynette have been best friends since they were small children. And as sister friends forever, they've always been there for one another through good times and bad, no matter what. Well, this year is a crucial turning point for each woman. Serena, still single, is questioning why love hasn't found her yet. Michelle is engaged and ready to walk down the aisle until an old flame strolls back into her life. Kenya is happily married, but at the same time, her husband's ex-wife won't allow them or their family to live in peace. And Lynette's divorce from her cheating husband has her nervously dating for the first time in well over a decade. During this difficult period, their friendship will be tested like never before, yet it is that sisterly love that they will need more than ever. That was one of the most popular books during the month of January at the library for the State Library for Accessible Books and Services. Now let's take a look at another book. This was very popular this past month as well. It's called The It Girl by Ruth Ware. Ruth Ware, the best selling author of The Woman in Cabin Ten and The Turn of the Key returns with the It Girl, an unputdownable, chilling domestic suspense from one of the best mystery writers since Agatha Christie. When studious, quiet Hannah Jones arrives on the campus of one of Oxford University's oldest and most prestigious colleges, Pelham College, she is stunned by the old-world grandeur, the intellect of her peers, and perhaps most of all, the opportunity to reinvent herself as something more than Abba-singing nerdy Hannah from never-heard-of-it Dodsworth. Immediately, almost unbelievably, she finds a way to do just that in her roommate's dazzling, painfully gorgeous April Clark Cliveden. And the oldie, oldest daughter of a new money family, the It Girl, April, has the world at her fingertips and has no problem flaunting it. Beyond the usual credit card fuel shopping trips and top-shelf alcohol binges, she delights in pulling pranks on her friends and dorm mates. They range from the usual, like a basket of glitter set to fall on an ignorant passerby, to the more intricate, like convincing a friend that she has an urgent meeting with the headmaster at 10.30 p.m. 
But it isn't long before Hannah begins to see a different side of April. For one while she may for one while she may have bought her way into Pelham, she definitely has the smarts and acting chops to back it up. For another, she can be exceedingly generous and thoughtful, like when she dresses up Hannah in an eight hundred dollar blouse to attend a student mixer. By fact or by force, it is not long before April and Hannah are best friends. For the first time, Hannah feels like she has arrived. Rounding out their twosome are April's jaw-droppingly handsome boyfriend, Will, his best friend, bookish Hugh, brash and witty Ryan, and whip-smart and calculating Emily. However, by the end of their first year... Hannah walks in on the unthinkable. April's body on their sweet floor. The last person seen leaving the room was John Neville, an eccentric but previously thought to be harmless porter. The murder has all the hallmarks of a viral true crime thriller. A gorgeous girl, an elite academic institution, and a suitably creepy suspect. And Hannah testifies as honestly as she can finding justice in Neville's unsurprising conviction. Now, ten years later, Hannah and Will are married and expecting their first child. They have found solace and comfort in their shared tragedy, the scars of which are so inexplicable to anyone who wasn't there. Occasionally, Hannah is still shocked by all that transpired, not just April's murder, but the freedom it gave her to explore her feelings for Will. But nothing can prepare Hannah for her mother's phone call, telling her that Neville, who had protested his innocence since day one, has died in prison, old, alone, and hated. Unsurprisingly, this latest development pushes April's murder to the forefront of the media's attention, and it's not long before an eager young reporter comes calling. But instead of wanting a gut-wrenching, voyeuristic inside take, he claims to have become close to Ryan and learned some aspects of his friendship with April that have never come to light. This leads Hannah to revisit that night and look back on her youthful friendships with a fresh, mature gaze, one that sees through some false alliances and to the heart of deep-seated angers, hurts, and betrayals. Alternating between Hannah's first year at Pelham and the arrival of the reporter into her life, Ware chronicles a twisted, complicated, and layered friend group where each member has something to hide, something to fight for, and, just maybe, something to kill for. Past-present narratives are not new in the world of thrillers, but she handles Hannah's character evolution with verve and masterful control. Her transformation from people-pleaser, who just felt lucky to be in her friend's orbits, to an adult who is ready to face the truth is just as compelling as the mystery of April's murder. Ware keeps each development and reveals crisp and to the point, all while building a creeping level of suspense that will give even the most assured reader the jumps. Ruth Ware has been described as indefatigable, and, while I typically don't quote other reviewers, this reviewer says, I can't think of a better description for this brilliant, engrossing writer. The It Girl is all the best of wear, insidious, evil, shivering suspense, shocking final reveals, with perhaps some of her strongest character development to date. It seems impossible that she gets better and better, and yet, when can I read her next book? And that was from a a review by Rebecca Monroe that was done in July this past year. It's called... The IT Girl, The It Girl, by Ruth Ware. Now on Heard Any Book Goods Book Lately, let's just turn to another book. This is a new one. It's called The Last to Vanish by Megan 
Miranda. When a man arrives at a North Carolina mountain hotel looking for clues to his journalist brother's recent disappearance, the trail that he and the end's young manager start to follow leads them back to a sequence of unsolved cases decades apart that involve other missing hikers and that may be rooted in the town's deepest secrets. Labeled by the national press as the most dangerous town in North Carolina, Cutter's Pass is a pretty place in which hikers have over the years had a tendency to vanish. There were the Fraternity Four, as a group of students came to be called, who disappeared in 1997. Alice Kelly in 2012, Farah Jordan in 2019, and Landon West in 2022. To Abby Lovett, however, Cutter's Pass, and in particular the town's hotel, the Passage Inn, has become her adopted home and her refuge from a troubled past. As manager of the inn, Abby has come to know everybody, to love wild mountain trails, and to learn that appearances can be deceptive. Things here were designed to appear more fragile than they were, she notes of the inn's folksy touches, but reinforced because they had to be. We lived in the mountains on the edge of the woods, subject to the whims of weather and the forces of nature, she says. In economical yet elegant descriptions, author Miranda repeatedly conjures up this untamed natural world, even as she unspools a labyrinthine plot that has its roots in the distant past, but that originates in the presence when Trey West appears one stormy night at the Passage Inn. He believed he could find them all, Abby realizes, when she and Trey, drawn to each other and into the quest for Trey's missing brother, find a clue that links the most recent mystery to each of the ones that went before. The novel's characters are deftly sketched, and its suspense is a nicely tightened though through the plot, finally loses itself somewhat in a tangle of strained connections. A richly atmospheric thriller with a plucky heroine. It sounds like a good one. It's called The Last to Vanish, and it's by Megan Miranda. Now let's uh, take a look at a book by a very popular author, Lee Child, and this one is called No Plan B, and it is a Jack Reacher novel. Here's the plot. In the latest volume from Child, Inc., in which the retiring Lee's younger brother, Andrew, will soon take over the Jack Reacher franchise, the colossal ex-army cop traces the killing of a woman in a Colorado town to a gruesome prison conspiracy in Mississippi. Now, the death is ruled a suicide, but Reacher saw a man push the woman under a bus and steal her purse. After tracking down and disposing of the culprit, he learns that the woman worked for a private prison in Mississippi, and it returned to Colorado to run troubling statistics about the prison's operation past her former boss. He died of a supposed heart attack 12 hours before her death. Teaming up with the man's tough-skinned ex-wife, Reacher heads south to sort things out, wired to move toward danger. Fearing Reacher will interfere with their deadly schemes, prison officials set up a network of roadblocks outside of town to pick him off. Meanwhile, a vulnerable 15-year-old boy escaping his abusive foster mother in Los Angeles travels to Mississippi after his birth mother tells him life-changing truths about his father. He, too, is targeted by bad guys. Most of the ingredients of Classic Reacher are here. Our sadistic hero delivers bone-crushing blows to his hopeless foes with sadistic satisfaction, would you care if you stepped on a cockroach? He eludes the traps set for him and penetrates the high-security prison. He drinks a lot of coffee and beds a local woman. What's missing in this follow-up to the collaborative 
Better Off Dead from 2021, is Lee Child's elegant writing for which he hasn't received enough credit. The sentences here are short and metronomically flat, and the early sections are uncharacteristically disjointed, says the reviewer, but fans who who come for the action and the traveling tips, a folding toothbrush is best, he advises, will not be disappointed. This is a grimly efficient addition to the Reacher, Reacher canon, says the reviewer, which was written, and it was written in uh, October of 2022. So it's a relatively new book, and uh, they're all good, aren't they? A Jack Reacher novel, No Plan B, it's called, and it's by the popular author Lee Child. And you're listening to Heard Any Good Books Lately, an exclusive production of the North Carolina Reading Service. I'm George Douglas. Thanks for joining me today. Great to have you with me on this program. Now we're going to turn to a book called Always By My Side, Live Lessons from Millie and All the Dogs I've Loved by Edward Grennan. The editor-in-chief of Guidepost Magazine shares the heartfelt, honest, lovely New York Times bestselling author Dean Kuhn's story of Millie, his beloved golden retriever, and how he taught him to be a more compassionate person, deepened his faith, and inspired him on his long-term path of recovery from addiction. With a foreword by Debbie McComber. From the moment his new golden retriever puppy jumped into his arms, Edward Grennan and his wife Julie were in love with her. Edward didn't know it yet, but Millie would change his life. In this moving memoir, Edward Grennan writes about his life with Millie. From their first joyous meeting, through her struggle with cancer and eventual heartbreaking death, Edward shares how her sensitivity, unconditional love, and innate goodness helped him discover those qualities in himself and put his complicated past in perspective. Edward also shares the lessons he has learned from other dogs he's loved, like Pete, a poodle his father bought him in the wake of his brother's death, Rudy, who introduced him to his wife, Sally Brown, a mischievous Cocker Spaniel who befriended the homeless in his neighborhood. And Marty, a hundred-pound Labrador whose behavioral issues challenged his and Julie's marriage, as well as lessons he's learned from the celebrated dog stories in Guideposts magazine. Poignant and insightful, Always by My Side is an inspiring book that explores the unbreakable bond between man and dog, revealing how faith shapes our love for our dogs and how dogs shape our faith. Once again, this is called Always By My Side, Life Lessons from Millie and All the Dogs I've Loved by Edward Grennan. Next, let's talk about a new book by Simon Block. This one is called Keep the Home Fires Burning. In Britain's darkest hour, an extraordinary community of women strives to protect the home front. When an enemy plane crashes in the village, every one of their lives will change forever. Return to Great Paxford or join us for your very first visit. Join Francis Barden, Sarah Collingborn, Pat Sims, Miriam Brensley, and the women of the great Paxford Women's Institute as calamity hits their beloved village and they prove once again that when women work together, they can surmount almost any challenge. Frances struggles as her factory is shut down and her husband's secret child arrives at her door. Pat received a respite when her abusive husband went to cover the war, but now he's home. Newlyweds Teresa and Nick come under tremendous pressure due to the secret Teresa hides. Meanwhile, the life of the Campbell family is turned on its head as a serious illness runs its course. 
and Allison finds new purpose in helping the influx of strangers to the village. Through it all, the Women's Institute provides support and camaraderie. But is their combined strength enough to get them through the war? Perfect for fans of Call the Midwife, Granchester, and Foyle's War. If you adore the novels of Nadine Dorries, Diney Costello, and Daisy Stiles, this is an unmissable series for you. Once again, the book is entitled Keep the Home Fires Burning by Simon Block. Now here's another very popular book. It's called Night Song by Beverly Jenkins. Beverly Jenkins is a very popular American author of historical and contemporary romance novels with a particular focus on 19th century African American life. Night Song is a sizzling tale of unbridled passion. In 1882, Kara Lee Henson knows no soldier can be trusted to stay in one place, and that included handsome Sergeant Chase Jefferson from the 10th Cavalry Buffalo Soldiers, who are being honored by her Kansas town. Rumor has it that Chase is definitely not the marrying kind. Dallying with the dashing man in blue could cost the pretty, independent young woman her reputation and her job as a schoolteacher. So, Kara is determined to repel Chase's advances, even though her aloof facade barely masks her smoldering desire for never before has she longed for a man the way she aches for chase. On the other hand, the charismatic cavalryman has no intention of taking no for an answer. With his tender words and soulful caresses, Chase intends to conquer the strong-willed ebony beauty before he leaves town and teach her how to love fully, sensuously, and forever." Irresistible characters and a story brimming with passion and excitement make Night Song a romantic delight. Once again, that is by the popular American author, Beverly Jenkins, and the book is entitled Night Song. Now here's a new book that has become very popular. It's called Tomorrow, Tomorrow, and Tomorrow by Gabriel Zevin. The Adventures of a Trio of Genius Kids United by Their Love of Gaming and Each Other. When Sam Masser recognizes Sadie Green in a crowded Boston subway station, midway through their college careers at Harvard and MIT, he shouts, Sadie Miranda Green, you have died of dysentery. Well, this is a reference to the hundreds of hours, 609 to be exact, the two spent playing Oregon Trail and other games when they met in the children's ward of a hospital where Sam was slowly and incompletely recovering from a traumatic injury and where Sadie was secretly racking up community service hours by spending time with him, a fact which caused the rift that has separated them until now. They determine that they both still game, and before long they're spending the summer writing a soon-to-be-famous game together in the apartment that belongs to Sam's roommate, the gorgeous, wealthy acting student, Marx Watanabe. Marx becomes the third corner of their triangle, and decades of action ensue. Much of it set in Los Angeles, some in the virtual realm, all of it riveting. A lifelong gamer herself, Zevin has written the book she was born to write, a love letter to every aspect of gaming. For example, here's the passage introducing the professor Sadie is sleeping with and his graphic engine, both of which play a continuing role in the story. The seminar was led by 28-year-old Dove Mitzra. It was said of Dove that he was like the two Johns, Carmack and Romero the American boy geniuses who'd programmed and designed Commander Keen and Doom rolled into one. 
Dove was famous for his mane of dark curly hair, wearing tight leather pants to gaming conventions, and yes, a game called Dead Sea, an underwater zombie adventure, originally for PC, for which he invented a groundbreaking graphics engine. Ulysses to render photorealistic light and shadow in water. Readers who recognize the references will enjoy them, and those who don't can look them up and or simply absorb them. Zevin's delight in her characters, their qualities and their projects, sprinkles a layer of fairy dust over the whole enterprise. Sure to enchant even those who have never played a video game in their lives with instant cult status for those who have. Once again, the book is called Tomorrow, Tomorrow, and Tomorrow, and it's by Gabriel Zevin. Now we conclude the program today with uh, The Family Remains. It's a novel by Lisa Jewell. In this sequel to The Family Upstairs from 2019, two siblings continue to deal with the fallout of their traumatic childhoods. Lucy Lamb is living with her brother Henry after the two have been reunited, and she's focused on reconnecting with her eldest daughter Libby and building a more stable life for her younger kids. But when Libby locates her birth father, Finn Thompson, who lived as a teenager with Lucy and Henry, all their parents were part of a cult led by Finn's father and died together in a suicide pact. The family begins making plans to go visit him in Botswana until word comes that Finn has taken a leave of absence from his job. After tracing Finn to Chicago, Henry leaves abruptly to go find him and cuts off all communication, prompting deep concern in Lucy, who knows of Henry's dangerous obsession with Finn, which goes so deep that Henry has fashioned himself to look like Finn. Meanwhile, human remains have been found in the Thames and traced to the childhood home Libby inherited, which leaves all three wanted for police questioning when it is determined the victim lived with Henry, Lucy, and Libby in their childhood home and was murdered. Separately, an unrelated character named Rachel Rimmer remembers her disastrous marriage when she is contacted about her abusive husband's murder. In this latest thriller, Jewel dives back into the psyche of Henry Lamb, one of her most unsettling characters. She attempts to weave together four narratives, but takes too long to develop connections among the disparate stories, which means the novel is weighted down with unrelated murder victims and minor characters, both of which detract from the suspense of Henry's pursuit of Finn. Nonetheless, a paced thriller that fails to match its predecessor's level of intensity, but is still an exciting book. The Family Remains, a novel by Lisa Jewell. And that's it for this month's edition of Heard Any Good Books Lately. I'm George Douglas. This program is brought to you by the friends at the State Library of North Carolina Accessible Books and Library Services. This program is intended for people who are blind or print impaired. Heard Any Good Books Lately will be available right after the broadcast at our website, ncreadingservice.org. So long until next time. (music) 